Okay, so those are so those are the rules that we have to follow. You can pass through a variable at most once. That one's intuitive. You don't really need to think about that one. The best way to think about rule two is you can start moving backwards, but you can't switch to moving backwards. And once you've started backwards, when you do turn around, you can't go back forward. You can't, sorry, once you, once you turn around from going backwards, i.e. moving forward, you can't switch again. Did we do an example? Let's see if that one. Yeah, I don't quite understand backwards. All right, so I can move, I can go from here, from A to 1, I can go back to Xi2. I can then pass along the path, and I can move forward along gamma 1,1. One, one. That's a that's an acceptable path. Okay, so that that's the path. So from A to 1,1, one, one, from A to 1,1 one, one to, or better, from A to 1,1 one, one to Xi1. It's moving backwards, and then we switch. And you can only switch one. I can only switch once, correct? So you. Or, Bay, let's look. So we let's look at. Practice. Yeah, let's look at A to two. So A to two, I can move. Along A to two, I can move backwards along gamma two one, to xi one. I can cross the path to xi two. And now I can I can only move forward, so I'm moving forward along. Gamma one two and forward along beta two one. Okay. So that's uh, backward to forward. You can only do that switch. And then any of your paths can only have a single double headed arrow. Now, the nice part about this is let me this is one thing I do like to emphasize. You don't have to do this. At S, almost every program that I know that does structural equation modeling now does all this for you. Alright, so it will do the, the work for us. <laughs> Um, but we still need to know what's happening behind the back. All right. Now, the protocol for path analysis, and this is not exactly what we do with SCM, but the protocol for path analysis is you start by calculating the multiple regression equations for each of your endogenous variables. You determine all the legitimate paths between the pairs for your variables. From there, you calculate the model predicted correlation. That's essentially what we were doing. I only did it for two of our variables here but that's what you would do. And then step four, compare the correlation matrix from the model to the correlation matrix for the raw data. And again, this is to assess model fit. So now we're not looking at, we're not looking at areas of squares of difference of predicted values. This is actually really interesting because this is where you first start to get the hint that Wow, I'm making a prediction for y, but I don't even care what that prediction is. I only want to know what my correlations are. I'm only looking at the patterns of the variables, not the predicted values. So we're comparing the correlation matrix. All right, let's clarify a couple, a few more things here, and then we'll work a handful of examples, talk through a handful of examples, and call it quits. So let's actually talk about the effects now. So there are four total effects. So the direct effect is when you have two adjacent variables and one's pointing directly to the other. That's the direct effect. And the indirect effect is when you are only moving forward but you have at least one moderating variable. So we already saw those. I'll come back and bring this one back up really quickly. So this is the direct effect from A to 1 to A to 2. Uh, for, I'm sorry, sorry, Xi1 to A to 2. The direct effect is here. The indirect effect is along gamma 1, 1, beta 2, 1. So indirect because it has at least one intermediary variable in between. Now, indirect means you are only moving forward. That is part of the rule. So the effect, an indirect effect is only moving forward. So there's two other types of effects. I need to calculate all four of these possibilities to calculate my correlation between my variables. But that does not necessarily give me the entire effect. In fact, this will actually often be larger than the entire effect. The entire effect, or total effect more appropriately, is just the direct and the indirect effect. 
So we need to consider all of these when we're, when we're calculating the correlation. When you're getting that matrix, when you're doing building what we call the model predicted matrix, okay. all four of these are important for that. Okay. Yeah. But not for the total effect. For the total effect, it's actually just the direct and indirect effect. And if it helps to think of it, it's the total causal effect. That's why. Because it's, it, that's, that's why that moving forward part is important. All right. Now, this one is a little tricky. Anytime you cross, if you're moving in one direction only, either only forward or only backward, and you cross a curve, or I should have said a bidirectional curve, Anytime you cross a bidirectional, so this would be considered an unexplained effect between psi 1 and psi 2. Okay? It's along a curve. There's some relationship there, but I don't, I'm not trying to explain what it, I'm trying to explain the relationship between A to 1 and A to 2 through its influence of these two variables, psi 1 and psi 2. But I'm not making any attempt to explain this. So that's what we call an unexplained effect. But there's also an unexplained effect from A to 1 to Xi 2. Because if I move backwards along, if I move backwards along gamma 1, 1 and cross this path, the key is, bless you, I've only moved in one direction. I only went backwards before I crossed the path. Before, I'm sorry, before I crossed the curve. Alternatively, I could have actually had, so, so the effect of A, so the unexplained effect between A to 1 and Psi 2 is gamma 1, 1 and R. So let's see, is there an unexplained effect from A to 2 to gamma 1? It would be gamma 2, 2, gamma 2, 2 and Psi 2, which I think we have. Uh, gamma 2, 2 and R, and R, so we have that one, gamma 2, 2 and R, 2, 1. This one is the unexplained effect. But technically, this is unexplained also. Beta 2, 1, gamma 1, 2, I'm still moving backwards, and then I cross the, the, the curved arch. So that also is an unexplained effect. Because it's unexplained because I haven't explained this connection here. All right, because anytime I cross that. The last one is the spurious effect, and that's anytime you have a bi-directional path. And it can include a curve, it doesn't, it can or can't include a curve, it doesn't actually matter. So a bi-directional effect is anytime, is, a spurious effect is the bi-directional path. So let's look at this one. The most obvious bi-directional path is from A to 1 to A to 2. The bidirectional path here is going back along gamma 1, gamma 1, 1 to psi 1, cross the path, and then move back toward A to 2 along gamma 2, 2. So that's what we consider a spurious path. From A to 1, 1 to psi 1, psi 1 to psi 2 along the curve, psi 2 to A to 2. Now, this also is a spurious path. So A to 1 influences A to 2 directly, but it also has a spurious effect by being influenced by Xi 1, which in turn influences A to 2. So this is a spurious effect. Anytime you have a bidirectional path where you're partially moving backwards, partially moving forward, that is considered spurious. Again, the nice part is we don't need to worry about things. <laughs> we, we, we need to know that they are possibilities. But the key is SPSS, not SPSS, um, ANUS, EQS, LISRL, M plus, SCADA, SAS, all the big ones now actually have features where it will run the model for you, be it a path analysis or a, a structural equation model, and it will tell you what the direct and indirect effects are. And it actually does the, it, it also generates this full correlation matrix, covariance matrix, but it does it in a slightly different way than we did here. It turns out they're the same solution, but it's a different, different estimation process. So we don't have to do it, we just need to know what's happening behind the, behind the wizard screen.
Now, I'll get, I already said this, all four effects are used to estimate the model, but only the direct and indirect effects are what are used to explain the variance. In fact, if I, do, if I did my math correct, your R squared should be your direct and indirect effects added together. So what do you actually report when it's all said and done? Well, you'd report a really good path analysis report would report both the sample matrix and the model estimated correlation matrix. It would report the effect sizes, the direct and indirect effect sizes, and then the explained variance. Now, if you haven't had a chance to read that chapter I put up on uh, Blackboard, now would be the best time to read it. In some ways, it's one where it's better to read it after hearing this stuff than reading it before. It's really brief, and you don't, I took out, I just, I just gave the core part of it, took out all the SPSS stuff. Um, it will make it, because they'll demonstrate in a couple ways how you actually would put those, report all that information. Um, the last thing from path analysis is the idea of model adjustment. So once you've checked your matrix, your correlation matrix for your data and the correlation matrix for your model, then you ask, well, does the model fit? If it fits, yay, we're done. We can stop. <laughs> if it doesn't fit, then we ask, well, what things were significant? We'll keep those. We'll consider getting rid of the stuff that's not significant. We may revise the model, meaning we'll actually add paths. Because remember, the stuff that's not there is there. It's just zero. We'll just make it not be zero. And then the third or the fourth alternative is maybe why well, I guess I keep I think of one and two as one together. That's why my brain just said the third. If we add a new variable, that's when you say, well, well, look, I've got I actually do have additional variables that I've collected data on. Maybe I want to throw those into the mix as well. It is. Yep. Now, I usually though. That's been determined because of the temporal ordering. So changing it could be a bit tricky. And any anytime you do change a model, you still need to be able to justify it theoretically. But yes, the answer to the answer to the question, can you change it, is it mathematically? Yes, you can change it mathematically. All right, so let me let me go ahead and close this and the next thing I'm going to do is actually I'm going to let me stop the recording really quickly I'm going to do something else and we'll do an example to try to, to make this a little more concrete <laughs>